Uh, greetings once more. Um, I'm going to ask you all to allow me three more minutes just to allow other audiences to join in and then we will continue thereafter. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Vino Yamasiba, and I'm the marketing coordinator for ASCA, which is African Institute for Supply Chain Research. Uh, welcome to our fourth session of research support webinar series. Um, can we all mute ourselves to avoid background noise? And you are also allowed to unmute yourself when permitted to speak only. After the presentation, we'll be taking questions. You can write your uh, questions in the chat box, even your comments. And also after the presentation, you can raise your hand if you have any questions to ask. Thank you. Um, today we have our guest speaker, who is Prof. Ashley Mutezo. Prof. Ashley Mutezo is an esteemed professor from the School of Economic and Financial Sciences at the University of South Africa. She has an experience of over 11 years in the university, uh, which is known as UNISA. Uh, Prof. Mutezo started as a senior lecturer in the university for more than six years, and now she's an associate professor since 2016 till present in the University of South Africa. She has a DCOM, small and medium enterprise financing and credit rationing, the role of banks in South Africa. And she has also an MCOM, BCOM, an MCOM business management obstacle in the access to SMME finance and empirical perspective on TWAN. I would like for us to welcome Prof. Ashley Mudezo. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vinolia, and thank you um, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I'm so humbled to, to be here this afternoon to talk about uh, literature review for our MND uh, studies. Uh, yes, I'm in the Department of Finance, Risk Management and Banking, and I am currently um, supervising, I've supervised uh, M&D students to, uh, to completion. So this afternoon, I'll be taking you through an overview of um, how, how to uh, start uh, lit your literature review, because for those who are new to the M&D studies, I'm sure you are wondering 
what is this, how are you going to go about the literature review? Because it is actually one of the uh, sort of people call it a difficult part of the uh, thesis of, of, of the dissertation. So we are just going to give you an overview of where to start or why do you even have to do the literature review? So uh, without wasting time, I'm just going to go through um, what I'm going to cover this afternoon. So in terms of background, uh, these are the things that I'm going to cover. Uh, defining what is, what is literature review, the purpose of a literature review, evaluating the relevance of a literature review, the value and the sufficiency of literature to your research, and conducting how you can conduct your research and uh, the possible deficiencies in, uh, in the literature. So this will give you a, at least an idea of how to go about your literature review. So in terms of the definition of literature review, of course, I think you're asking yourself, what is it anyway? Um, it is the process of making reasoned judgments and organizing your thoughts into the written re uh, review that many find difficult and time consuming. So looking through the experience that I've had, you find that many students find it difficult to put the literature review chapter together because then they don't know where to start. They don't know how to determine which uh, literature to include. And at the end of the, uh, the day, you find that a lot of people find, uh, spend a lot of time, more time or even more than necessary on the literature because they don't know exactly where they are going to. It is a review of what is happening around your topic. So before you even start reviewing your literature, first of all, you need to um, confirm or understand your topic. Because when you understand your topic, then you are able to then um, categorize or determine what are the major concepts in that um, study that you want to do. So understanding the topic is very important because then it will help you or guide you uh, on which literature to uh, look at. Again, we do literature review because it is an integral part of our thesis or dissertations. I'm also uh, bearing in mind anyway that in the group we have a mixture of uh, masters and uh, PhD students and the focus anyway of those uh, studies are a bit different because at uh, master's level you simply want to see whether one has mastered the process of research whereas at doctoral level we want to see the contribution that you, uh, you bring to your particular discipline. It also provides the context and theoretical framework of your research. Like any other project that you uh, work on, literature review also needs uh, a foundation. And your foundation, these are the theoretical frameworks that are found in the discipline or the area that you want to research in. So in a way, by doing literature review or by looking at the scholarly work that is in the area that you want to study, you get an idea of the trends uh, of thought that have developed over time and also what the gurus in the um, discipline have been writing and how uh, you know the ideas they've been changing over time. Then you also um, look at literature review as a critical and analytical account of the most relevant literature to a particular topic. So you can only determine that after you have gone through articles, books, and um, all the resources that you can come across to be able to determine whether this is the most relevant literature to your particular topic. I will um, expand on that as we go along. So what is the purpose of a literature review? The purpose of a literature review is to provide the foundation on which you, your research is built. So 
So you find that um, if you are not guided, some students, they go on to write a dissertation without uh, maybe theoretical framework. And you find that it lacks the foundation. At the end of the day, it lacks the foundation. And once the examiner realizes that we have a study here which does not um, have a foundation on which it is built, uh, then the you know the the examiner is tempted to uh, send back the the piece of work for revision. So we need to make sure that we include uh, the theoretical frameworks and the foundation which uh, build your uh, research study. And then uh, you need also uh, the literature review because then it is a discussion of the relevant theories and concepts that underpin the research. Before you even go on to do the literature, you need to understand what are the concepts that are found in that particular field that you want to research on. So, and also what are the relevant theories behind those concepts? So. Once you identify that, they then guide you on what to include and what not to include. And also in terms of concepts, you know, the, the, the definitions that, you know, they have been, they are dynamic or they've been changing and what arguments they've been coming through in terms of those concepts. So that again is an essential part uh, in terms of the purpose. Literature review also, pinpoints gaps in the research of a particular field. The whole idea behind literature review is then for you to identify a gap in literature, and then that will help you determine or write your problem statement. You can only do that after you have read widely. And when we say widely, from my experience on a doctoral level, just the proposal alone, you, you, I consider 100, 100 uh, references of peer-reviewed um, pieces of work, which includes your books, your uh, journal articles. So that after reading so many, you can actually be able to at least pinpoint if there is a gap or the arguments that have been put across in those um, uh, references that we have uh, referred to. And at the end of the day, even the reader can see which gap or what gap your study is uh, filling. It also assists the student in gaining insight into relevant and previous research and emerging trends. So in so doing, you when you look at all the literature, that is uh, the empirical, theoretical and, and empirical literature, that has um, been put forward in the discipline over a period of time, then you are able then to determine which literature is relevant to your study, uh, what is the previous uh, research saying about uh, what you intend to study, and also what are the emerging trends. So that's why then we need to, if you now want to look at the yes, um, just at the emerging uh, trends, now you need to um, look through over time and see the arguments that uh, researchers have been putting through over time and the, the, the most recent ones, what are they saying? Because then it will help you to uh, see whether what you want to study is relevant and appropriate. It also helps to identify contradictory results and opposing findings. So this is part of the empirical literature if you are doing your uh, literature review. So you need now to see whether there are agreements here and there about the findings, if there are regress regressions or correlations, what are the general findings, what are the contradictions? And then also you, the, it provides supporting evidence that your research questions and objectives are worth researching. So it gives you that justification once you have gone through um, the literature. So mainly those are the purpose that, or that is the purpose of a literature review. 
So it is also important as well, um, literature review in terms of evaluating the relevance, value and sufficiency of literature to your research. So what do we mean by that in terms of relevance? How recent uh, maybe is the item that you want to refer to? I think you have heard supervisors saying your 80% should be in the last 10 years. That is in terms of um, how recent, because then it gives you uh, the arguments and discussions that are going on um, in that particular discipline. Does the item meet your relevance criteria? Remember, when you do literature review, you also have a criteria that you use for uh, inclusion and exclusion. So for example, if you are uh, doing a research, let's say on, I'll give an example on, on, on um, poverty. Of course, you need to um, indicate or give an inclusion or an exclusion criteria to say what type of poverty are you looking at? And uh, in terms of scope, the different types of poverty, the, the, of poverty that uh, you know, one experiences, and also you can then scale it down to a specific aspect of poverty that you are not just the global one, but maybe you want to narrow it down to the African or to a particular uh, region within uh, the, the continent. Does the item support or contradict your arguments? Also, you get this from uh, reading a lot of um, literature. In terms of value, you, again, you need to read things that, are, that add value to, to your study. Remember, it's not about just getting everything or just reading everything on the discipline. You need to be selective. Only include that which uh, brings in value. Has the item been subject to a review process uh, via publication? That's why we say peer reviewed journal articles and books. Uh, does the item appear to be biased? What are the methodological omissions? So all this you get from reading um, the empirical work and the theoretical work that has been done. Does the item provide guidance for future research? Along the way, you realize sometimes what you wanted to um, investigate. As you read, you realize oh, it has already been done. But when you look at the that part of the um, literature or the journal article, which says uh, areas of further research, you can actually get an idea. And that's why you find sometimes you find your topic or your title, you end up changing because you have realized that certain things that you wanted to investigate have already been investigated or there are better ideas that have been put forward by authors who have already gone down the same route as you, and then it gives you an idea of uh, how to proceed. And then in terms of sufficiency, if you uh, read uh, new items or do you recognize the um, authoritative authors in the discipline? So if you write literature review without acknowledging you know, the gurus of the, that discipline, then your literature review might be inadequate. The examiner might send it back to say, this is uh, in, uh, sort of inadequate. So you need, um, you ask yourself, do you have sufficient items to satisfy the assessment criteria? So again, you need to look at the assessment criteria of your institution and see if, um, when you do your literature review, are you satisfying those, uh, that criteria? Then in terms of conducting your research, there are various ways of conducting um, your research. Uh, you can do that through the online databases. Uh, you can do that through relevant literature, which is referenced in books and journal articles. You can browse and scan literature in your library, or you can do general online search. Uh, what I need to stress here is um, the moment you start doing uh, your, your research study, you need to contact your librarian. I think you just need your librarian to, to, to be you know, close to you so that at least they can guide you. They already have uh, an idea or like in our case for UNISA, we've got specialist librarians in each discipline. So they will be actually there to help us determine which um, 
which which um, articles are most relevant to the discipline. And then you also, uh, the librarian will also help you in terms of the databases, which database to consult. That is very important. And while we are on that also, they will advise on the quality of journals to uh, refer to. As we are aware, there are predatory journals which are you know, all over, and your librarian is the one who is supposed then to, um, you can consult your librarian to determine whether that journal is a good journal. Because I think it is also becoming uh, an issue when examiners look at the references that you use, and if you use a lot of predatory journals, that could actually be uh, a problem. So your librarian here should uh, be able to help you through in terms of uh, browsing and scanning library is also this is in dissertations going to the right categories and general online searching. So with UNISA, we have got a lib guide which uh, actually helps us to, um, you know, to, to guide the student in terms of which books, in terms of literature, or in terms of just um, articles and journals that actually helps uh, a lot. The other thing that I need to emphasize on this one is the issue of um, when you look at general online uh, searching, so try and avoid the uh, Wikipedia because that is not a peer-reviewed uh, source of information and therefore it would be advised to uh, stay away from Wikipedia and try and use as uh, much as possible the peer-reviewed um, articles or resources, study resources. And then also sometimes you can use your bibliographic details, maybe at the end of a thesis or at the end of, you find there's a lot of references. You can also use those um, references to see what uh, important literature you can include in the uh, particular discipline. So when you do your literature, there are so there are other things that we can uh, look at. When a student does a literature review, you can find that a, the literature may be uh, said to be uh, insufficient or it is uh, deficient in certain things. Why would it be? There are various ways or various things that we have to look out for that makes um, a literature review uh, deficient. So first of all, you've got your exclusion of uh, landmark studies. That's why I was saying here, if, for example, uh, you don't include the gurus in the discipline or in the field, then it could be a problem and uh, it could be a deficiency in your literature review. And then you, uh, we can also talk about outdated material. This is also very important. Like I said, I think I've already uh, hinted on that to say 80% of your uh, references should be recent ones. And then 20%, uh, of course, you can cite those theories or any seminal work uh, in the discipline. So that is acceptable, but make sure that at least the major part of your literature is um, recent because then it gives you the most uh, recent arguments around that, um, that area that you are studying. Then we also look at limited scope uh, in terms of your literature. So if you don't plan your literature review, you might find yourself uh, leaving out a lot of things or in terms of uh, exclusion, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. You have not included things that are essential or you have excluded things that are essential. So planning your literature review is very important uh, and that you get guidelines by reviewing other uh, scholarly uh, articles that have taken place already so that then you are able to determine, for example, if it is the, the, the variables that you want to include, if they have already been uh, in, used by other um, by other um, authors in the discipline, 
then at least you you know the how they have been measured and then it will be easier for you to um you know to put your argument through your a literature review also needs to be uh critical why do we say that is because um literature review is not about just um describing or summarizing articles yes we can we have articles there but you need then to once you you can describe in a paragraph or so what the article is about but you now need to analyze and synthesize uh, that article to see what exactly what is the argument in that particular article what are the relationships that are found there and also what are the deficiencies in that particular um, article that you are reading so so doing you need then to be able to say for example if um, certain authors are agreeing or they both the same argument and those that are contradicting and where is the contradiction coming from and then where does your own literature come in so you need uh, all those uh, to be able to critically you know review the literature in that discipline and add value to the body of knowledge and then uh, also lacking synthesis at the end of everything then you need to synthesize and um, come up with patterns and themes you know that are important to your particular slide uh, to your particular research so that synthesis is right at the end once you have gone through you have described you have uh, analyzed uh, and you have reviewed then you can come up with your own argument at the end of the uh, review and how it fits into your study and then lastly i think uh, plagiarism is also very important if these days i think your turn it in is very important you need to make sure that you don't plagiarize or you don't copy other people's work. So you need to abide by the, um, you know, the turn it in. It's more about, you know, turn it in is about similarity. So you want to try and put those ideas that you are seeing or that you are reading in your own uh, perspective and express them uh, in your own way to avoid the issue of uh, plagiarism. That is uh, a very important aspect in terms of the literature review that uh, you put across in your dissertation or thesis. So that is important. That's why we are saying you are not just going to summarize and take word for word from this. You need to think about what the authors are saying and uh, also how that uh, piece of work will add value to what you want to put across. So in a way, um, we have, I'm just going to conclude uh, for the sake of time here, I'm just going to conclude here to say what I've gone through this afternoon is very brief but it just gives you an overview of why we need to do literature review and um, how uh, to look at it or the perspective that you have to go uh, with when you start a literature review um, session. So we are saying here literature review is necessary to help candidates develop a sound understanding of previous work that relates to their research questions and objectives. So your literature should be linked to your research questions and objectives. Then it becomes relevant. Otherwise, it's not just a matter of writing anything that you come across. And uh, there is no correct way to structure a literature review. So what we are saying here, you, you look at it as a funnel. I can give an example here where, for example, one is looking at, for example, issues relating to leadership. So leadership is a broad, um, it, it's a broad discipline, but you can then narrow down 
to the different types of leadership that you find across. So there are different schools of leadership. And then from those different schools of leadership, you are going to indicate which uh, school you are going to concentrate on uh, it within your particular uh, research. And then maybe you are going to go instead of maybe the uh, global leadership, you are simply going to go to the uh, maybe lower level uh, leadership in an organization. So you specifically, your dissertation could be specific to middle management. And you are looking at leaders in middle management. So look at it as a, a funnel, or you use literature review now to narrow down to, you know, the that aspect of your research to be very specific so that then the reader sees the global uh, part and then they also see how you, um, you, you you narrow it or how you arrive at your sort of uh, research study level. So that is also uh, important. And then you look at your secondary literature versus the, um, the, 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 the gray literature. Remember when you do your literature review, there, um, there is a primary data and also you can also look at uh, your secondary. And in this case, you are looking at your, uh, your secondary data, uh, your, which, part, which makes part of the literature review. So you need also to look at, the, you know, for example, uh, you can have um, literature or you can refer to newspaper articles, you can refer to, uh, you know, those other, you know, articles or references that give uh, what is happening, for example, in the economy around you. So it could be a newspaper, it could be a television uh, report or whatever. You need to um, be able to gauge that between your um, peer-reviewed literature and uh, this type of literature that has not been verified, but we can also use it, um, for example, in your problem statement to see, to indicate where the problem is by, for example, events that have taken place in your community or arguments that have uh, taken place uh, in the um, at a national level. And then you can use it then to bring out a problem that you want to um, that you have identified and would want to uh, research on it in an effort to resolve or to find a solution which will be applied um, in real life. And then uh, prior to conducting the literature uh, research, you, as a candidate, you need to also have a clear research uh, questions and objectives. Like I indicated, your topic is very important. You need a very uh, to be very clear on your topic because then if your topic is clear and your research persons and objectives are clear, it is easy to be able to identify the main concepts in that particular study. And therefore, you know, once you've got your concepts, you know what you are looking for in literature, it will guide you now what you are looking for. Um, also, um, you need to be able to, to define the parameters of the research. And how do you do that is by a way of literature review. You, are, you need to, um, the, the, the definition, some definitions have been changing over time. And therefore, that's why you need to um, like have a chronology. So when you read, you need to do it in a chronological way starting with the oldest articles, and then you have the newest and see how the arguments that are being put across have changed over time. You also need to uh, generate such terms and uh, phrases. This also is very important. For example, when you deal with librarians, they ask you about keywords, what are the keywords for your topic? Uh, what are the key phrases? Which are the areas or which is the discipline that, you, that will help to narrow down your um, your research to a specific uh, intention that you want to uh, to address your research, and then also to discuss um, ideas as widely as possible. 
you can only do that, discuss ideas as widely as possible if you have read wild, uh, widely. So it is important that you cover as much information as possible before you can actually uh, say, for example, there's a, there's a gap. For you to be able to say there's a gap in this um, particular discipline, it is through reading a lot of articles such that you are able to um, say there's a gap and convince the uh, reader with evidence that um, this is what is happening. And then you also need to take care uh, not to uh, plagiarize your work, the work of other people. So you need, there is what we call academic integrity in um, when you do your, your master's and doctoral uh, research. It, academic integrity is very important. That is where you acknowledge other people's work. You don't duplicate other people's work. And literature review is not about um, duplicating what has been done before. Then it becomes plagiarism. You need to use what is there for you to be able to put across arguments that um, you know will help to bring up uh, your, your own argument in this uh, particular research. So basically, I think those are the main um, aspects that I really wanted to put across in terms of uh, what to expect uh, or what to do when you start a literature review. So I think I will end here and uh, open the discussion for any questions so that at least it is uh, engaging, more engaging. Uh, thank you. And over to you, Precious. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for your insightful presentation. I would like to take this time to allow any questions which are available. Uh, as I have indicated that if you have any question, you can raise your hand or I'm gonna continue and read the comments and questions in the chat box. Okay, I have a comment from Walter Maliana. Walter Maliana said, afternoon colleagues, I am grateful to be part of this session and I'm looking forward to empowering, to an empowering and fruitful decision, discussion, sorry. And, um, Anna Nube is saying, afternoon, everyone. I'm in a taxi, but I will be listening. I'm hoping there will be a recording for the session in order to catch up on this important topic. And I would like to uh, let Anna Nube know that, yes, we do have uh, the recordings, which you can find them on our social media platforms. Uh, also, uh, we need Lamini says, uh, good, good day, Prof Mudezo. Looking forward to your presentation. And um, there's a question from Walter Maliana, which says, in your view, how effective is Tenantin in effectively detecting plagiarism? It continues and say, what do you do if you find out though there are limited research articles on the topic you want to research, there is uh, topical within the disciple, for example, uh, professionalization of a C SCM in South Africa. Over to you, Prof Mudezo. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, for the comments, I think uh, that is appreciated. And um, first, the first uh, question, how effectively uh, does it in determine plagiarism? Uh, I think the first thing that you need to understand about uh, Tenitin, like I said, it's not really about plagiarism, but it gives you 
uh, a level of similarity uh, in terms of um, the work that we have done with what is out there. So that percentage that you get is actually telling you how much your work is similar to the work that is already there that the software uh, is uh, identified. So in terms of, uh, we are not saying turn it in will determine plagiarism is like you copy, you copy. There are certain things, for example, in terms of um, concepts, definitions that you cannot do anything about in terms of uh, you, you can't change, but you just need to acknowledge to say, according to so and so, this is how this uh, concept is defined. But if you include a definition in your, in your study, then you take, let's say, Mouton's uh, definition, and you don't acknowledge Mouton there, then it becomes an issue with anything because it becomes it's similar now to that particular, and it will pick up those articles that are similar uh, or which have got a similar definition with that one. So you need to acknowledge to say this is according to so and so, or this idea is. Uh, according to so and so, and where you, you cannot also write the whole document with um, quotation marks, where you use direct quotation, you need to acknowledge that. But where you just need to acknowledge ideas, again, we cannot simply write and ignore as if all what you are putting across is your own idea. Because well, sometimes you are talking about ideas that have already been put across by other people. So you need to acknowledge those people uh, in your. Uh, in your text. So we are saying um, it helps, turn it in is a tool that helps us, uh, you know, not to copy other people's work, but to try and put our work in our own perspective and express it uh, from our, uh, you know, in our own way. So for me as a supervisor, I think it does serve a purpose it works because then it helps us to know to be able to express us in our own and not just uh, cutting and pasting and dumping the information in a, in a thesis or dissertation. And then uh, on the issues where you have uh, limited um, articles, I think it all depends again on um, how recent or on the nature of the problem that you're trying to resolve. It can happen if it is an area that has not been researched. It is a new area, for example, these new um, disciplines that are coming through uh, nowadays, which have not been referred to. You might find there are limited um, articles, limited books. In that case, uh, the best thing, like I was saying, consult your, your librarian because they've got a wider net when they use the, the library of the resources. So you can sit with them so that you see how far uh, the research uh, key terms that they use and everything, how far it can give you in terms of the articles that they can um, get for you. But if it is a new area, it has to be acknowledged in the, in the discussion or in the argument by way of the references that you make to say, when you say uh, they are limited, then tell us why you say so that they are limited, because then maybe you can actually indicate in that uh, this is to say, this is a new area uh, which has not been uh, sort of uh, researched, or maybe there are one or two, and therefore your uh, contribution now is adding to the board of knowledge by uh, sort of you know, your research study that you are, you are doing there. So that one, in terms of um, what to do, I think the best thing is to sit down with your promoter, uh, sit down with the librarian and try and see how you can uh, resolve that issue. Because at the end of the day, if they are limited or are no, you need to know how then to uh, start the discussion or the you know, the, the, the research in that particular field, you need guidance now of the promoter. I think that's what I can say from my side. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ashley. Uh, I see a hand from Anan Nube. Anan Nube, you may ask your question. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Professor and colleagues. Uh, my question is based on the uh, appropriate, what is the appropriate uh, percentage on the literature, on the similarity check on Tenetin? Like, how much must you have so that your literature is not a, a plagiarism? Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for that. Um person it is actually quite uh, it, there is no particular answer to say this is the right um, percentage it all depends according to it varies from institution to institution or from departments to departments in the institution as well so i think you have to go with the guidelines and criteria of your institution or your department but um looking some if you are in the regions of 20 percent to maybe 25 percent some consider it to be uh, reasonable because then there are certain things of course that definitely will be similar throughout and you cannot rule out to say a similarity index must be zero percent we, we, we can't i think that is we can't say that so there is that allowance to say those things that you can't change. Yes, they will allow up to maybe 20% or up to 25%. So there is no one specific uh, figure to say, this is the one for tenitin. It varies from institution to institution and also from your um, department and the assessment criteria as well. When you are being assessed, I think, um, the examination department has, you know, those cut, you know, cutoff points to say they accept up to that part. But also examiners, they do understand. So they can look through your, the, 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 you know, the turned in report and see exactly what the issues are. You may find some, some of the issues may be mainly because of references, which you cannot really uh, change. But at the same time, there are others then who maybe first of all, they write an article and then, or a dissertation, and then they want to, you know, write from that dissertation, then you need to reference even yourself to make sure that you don't plagiarize or you don't copy yourself. So there are lots of things that you can actually uh, do. But I must say, in the last few, I think last week I did attend a workshop on Tenetin, and I actually realized, uh, you know, how to check for all these things and how the how you know the system, you know, students can also manipulate the system. So I think I advise now, you know, these things are being monitored, and if don't, you know. <laughs> you don't 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 play around with the system when it comes to anything because then it all goes back to academic integrity. Uh, you know how 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 do you present yourself in terms of your arguments, in terms of uh, not copying other people's work, and for you to be a scholar, you need to observe uh, academic integrity. I think that's what I can say, uh, Anna. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, we're gonna continue taking more questions. Uh, we have a question on the chat box from Jonah. It says, we are advised to deal with unique topics, but after choosing such a unique topic, you realize there is limited prior information for the literature review. How does one go about such a scenario? Okay, that's an interesting uh, question, Jonah, and thank you for the question. Um, yes, we, I think people talk about unique topics, but it depends when you say unique topic, what uh, do you mean? So you need also to be careful when you uh, put across your, or you, you compile your topic for your dissertation. 
you don't, I think you also need to read around the area of discipline in where you want to do your research. Read around and understand what are the arguments going on, what are the trends that are going on, and then what makes what you want to do um, unique. For example, what you are saying, it might not have been researched or it's a new area that has just um, come through. Or uh, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's not relevant. Maybe that's why we don't have, that's why people have not been researching along those lines. So that um, alone, I think it's a discussion that you need to have with your supervisor or your promoter right at the beginning, like I said, your topic needs to be, you need to understand it very well. And um, no, establish whether the variables that you want to investigate, for example, do they exist? Have they been used before? Because it's actually easier when you are looking at variables that have been uh, verified, that have been used before, and what information is there already about how these, these variables relate to other variables or how they've been transforming over time. So the uniqueness of the topic there, I think is all dependent on uh, what you want to investigate, how relevant is that uh, topic to, you know, to the community or to the um, economy around you? Is it giving a solution to uh, a problem that is existing? So all those things I think you need to look at because um, you may find that, or, or sometimes it is an area that was investigated, but if you read around those, you find that maybe that aspect doesn't, uh, is not applicable anymore because of the changing environment. And therefore, people have stopped researching that and they have moved on to other issues. So I think it's something that uh, when you look at the uniqueness of a topic, is something that you really need to um, establish with your promoter before you even start literature review. I think that's uh, all I can say from my side, Yona. I hope that uh, helps. Well, Prof, I hope that is understood. Um, we're gonna continue taking more questions. We have a question from Subongi Le which says, Prof, when is it enough? When does one know that they have covered adequate and enough review of literature? Uh, you said it is from? It's from Sibongile. Sibongile. Okay, yes. thank you very much, Sibongile. Uh, that is a good question uh, to determine when it is enough. When do you determine it is enough, the, the, you know, the literature that you have done? and uh, sufficient and uh, relevant. Um, we have not gone really now into how exactly do you um, do your literature, but like I said, if you plan your project and you follow uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of a funnel where you start broad and you narrow down, you will find that um, you, you have to determine, first of all, you have to determine if there are any underlying uh, theoretical framework for your study, which is very important. So you need to include your the theoretical framework uh, in your study, very important. Then you need to uh, include um, your empirical research. This is research that has been done in that area by other people uh, all over, it could be all over the world. You need to establish the variable that we, uh, were used in that particular, so that at least you can see where the, the, gap, uh, the gap is. So you need also to determine what the variables um, that have been used in that area, what is the relationship that they found between, if, if for example, you are regressing, we are, we are finding correlation, what have others found before? So that you, 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 you can benchmark to say, 
when you do your own analysis, is it uh, at par with what you have already read? Is it in agreement or is it contradicting uh, literature? And then if it is contradicting literature, at the end, we are able to say this is, um, you know, why your, your, your research is contradicting. And maybe then you tell us maybe because of the changing dynamics or it's because you, know, you introduced another um, variable that may be, you know, uh, affected the way that this uh, variable is. So in this relationship, you establish a less, uh, relationship, you can only get them from literature. And then you need to uh, synthesize, evaluate and synthesize. So once you have covered that, your literature review, like I said, is supposed to be critical. It, it's a critical analysis, especially from a doctoral point of view. It must be critical. It's not a narration. It's an evaluation which is um, critical to say who are the authors that are maybe uh, in agreement with this particular argument. Who are the authors who are in disagreement? Why are they disagreeing? You know, and then where does your own research come in? So you find that if you really plan your literature review, you it will tell you that you you have um, you, you you have uh, addressed all issues relating to the concepts that are included in your um, topic or your research study. It you have attended to the theoretical framework, and it helps you now give you your own conceptual framework after reading through. So you have your own, so that the, now the reader knows that this is, you know, this is the scope of your literature. And your exclusion, for, I talked about the exclu inclusion and exclusion criteria. It will also tell you where to stop. So what to include and what not to include, that is your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it is actually <clears throat> possible to know that you have at least covered, you know, the greater part of what must go into your dissertation. And uh, the other thing I think that uh, I've just come across now is a new thing I think that is uh, coming through is uh, to um, reference with a uh, systematic literature review. I've just realized that you can actually do a systematic literature review for your own study for your, for your own doctorate, uh, where you look at all the literature that is in the discipline, and then you categorize after determining what you want in your um, study. For example, then you put your, is it, is it a, a sort of a um, qualitative study? So if it is a qualitative study already, you know which things we are looking for or which articles we are looking for that relate to qualitative. And if it is a quantitative already, you have demarcated your, um, your literature. And then within that maybe qualitative, what exactly are you looking at? Then you start looking at the concepts, you start looking at the uh, authoritative work, that is the seminar work in that particular um, discipline. And then if you narrow it down well, you will find that you would have covered, you know, the necessary aspects and then the arguments that are within um, that discipline. So in a way, yes, I think with a lot of planning before you actually embark on it, plan it rather than just read before you know what you are looking for. So I think um, if it is well planned, you can actually get that satisfaction yourself. After reviewing your literature, you can feel it yourself that you have covered, you know, all the aspects that are, you know, key to your topic. I hope that um, answers your question, uh, Sibonile. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, there's another question which says, is it advisable to use, to use systematic literature review at master's level from Winnie Lamini? 
Uh, thank you, Winnie. Um, systematic literature review. Um, I think it can. It depends with your with your promoter and, and also with your what do you want to achieve, your objective with your study. What do you want to achieve? Is it can be a whole study just on the systematic review of literature. Um, for 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 uh, yeah, I've seen a master's dissertation on that where the student just looked at the literature, categorizes it. And then when you are reading, you can actually, for example, like I was saying, the, the, the qualitative, you read all the qualitative and categorize them, the quantitative and categorize them. And then when, for example, you are looking at the, uh, for example, the, the quantitative will actually lead to what they call the meta metadata analysis, the meta analysis. So you can actually then say, for example, those articles that deal with that are quantitative, if it is a relationship between variables, if, for example, the p value they found it to be positive and significant, then you indicate it as uh, observation number one. And then you can have as many as possible and you end up with observations and then you analyze those observations as a you know, metadata analysis, it, it is possible. The same applies with your qualitative to say in your qualitative, maybe for example, who are the people who use the, for example, um, content analysis, who are those that use, you know, ethnography and whatever, and then you can analyze qualitatively and come to a conclusion about the findings from those articles. So it is possible, but it all depends on the um, on your on the objective and your topic and the objective. What do you want to achieve at the end of the day? So I think that is a you know all I can say from my side. I think you also need to make sure you uh, discuss it. If you want to go that route, you can discuss with your promoter and see if it is a, uh, a viable route to take. I hope that helps, Sweeney. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, there's another question from Tangeni Mwashekele, which says, what should I do if I found out that the literature are limited on my topic, but the problem do exist and need solution? Uh, you said it is from? It's from Tangeni Mwashekele. Tangeni. Okay. Uh, I think that's an interesting um, question as well. I think uh, partly I've already, someone has already spoken about the limited literature in an area um, of study, but you are saying that there is a problem already, but uh, there is no literature. So what we are, I, I think the way to go there, like I was saying, is to try and uh, search as widely as possible, especially with the help of your, of your librarian and try and go through all those uh, the, the online databases, uh, go through thesis and dissertations with other institutions. So the librarians, I think they have access to all uh, those different uh, databases of other universities globally. So you can scan through all those uh, databases and see if there's nothing that is similar to it. Because I'm not so sure. Maybe if we can have an example of such a problem which exists but does not have uh, literature or requires a solution, I think that will be, you know, a good uh, starting point. But from my point of view, I think we just need to uh, look wider and see if there's nothing. It might not be within the South African it might you know we might not have a solution from a south african uh, perspective but maybe globally this thing has happened somewhere before and if not i think uh, you just need to discuss that with the with your promoter and sometimes if there's no literature review really there's no point pushing through uh, if there's no literature because 
without if the literature review sets foundation for uh, any research study. So yeah, I think that that's a, that's a debatable one, which um, the promoter and the student can actually you know talk about and see what is viable and what information you know you can gather because like i said without literature review without a foundation it is so difficult because you have nothing to benchmark the study against i hope um, it answers your question uh, kangeni thank you prof um there's one last question from Pesti Mavie. Uh, it says, um, how many theories is one recommended to apply in his or her research? From Pesti Mavie. Thank you, um, Pesti, for that question. Um, there is no a uh, specific number that is given to say this is the number of theories. The theories depend on the um, keywords or the main concepts in your topic. So it's only the theories that go or that underpin the concepts that you are dealing with in your, uh, in your topic that are relevant to that particular topic. So, for example, like I was saying, uh, in terms of uh, leadership, you cannot really, you know, just include any, any theories of leadership until and when you have narrowed down your, 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 your leadership, maybe to the level or to the type of leadership. And then when you look at the type of leadership, by reading through uh, your literature, you will find that these are the most uh, important or common um, theories that underpin those concepts that you want to uh, include in your in your dissertation or in your thesis. So I cannot say one is enough or two. You find some people maybe have got three or four variables, and those four variables they are underpinned by different each variable by a different theory. Then you need to include the four, but if you are dealing with two um, variables and there are two theories, just include the two. It all depends on uh, the key concepts uh, in, your, in your topic. So again, my apologies. So again, um, you, you, you need to discuss this with your promoter and then plan it because you don't start by writing the theories you start by planning so when you read first of all you read and when you read you identify these theories then you go back to your topic and your conceptual framework is the one that is going to guide you so the concepts that are there in your um that guide your study are the ones that will tell you which theories to include so in a way, per se, um, there is no specific number of theories. It all depends on uh, your topic, your concepts that are being covered in your topic or the variables that you are dealing with in a topic. Those are the ones that will determine. And then the variables, um, once you go into literature, are they underpinned by one or by two theories? Then if it is two, you include because then you get the reasons why you need this theory and how this concept came about because it was building from you know um, these theories that have been put uh, across before. So in a way, uh, the other thing uh, you know that I can say is theories are important, especially for example where you do your your your, your variables and relationships. You can tell. Um, you can, the variables, they are emanating, they are emanating from theory. So it's something that has been uh, tested, tried and tested, it has been established, it's easier. If you are coming up then with your own variable, sometimes then you 
you, 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 you have to maybe you want to come up with your, the theory yourself to establish a theory and therefore you're working backwards to establish a theory. So it all depends on what the objective is and um, what the concepts that you want to put across are and then uh, you can put it from there. So I think uh, that's uh, what I can say from my side, PSP, and uh, I hope it helps. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. I believe that um, there are no more questions because I see there's a direct message. Uh, there's a message which is directed to you specifically. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to read it as a, <laughs> as a question because it's direct. So um, I believe. Yes, <laughs> I believe that we have um, come to a conclusion as we don't have any more questions. I have seen a lot of comments for people who are, who are requesting for presentations. Yes, we do have presentations, uh, slides. If you want a presentation slide, you can uh, email us on info at asca.org.za. And then we will send you the presentation slide. And also for those who are requesting um, a recording for this uh, session, we do have our social media platforms where you can access the videos uh, online for free. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We are uh, ASCA, which is African Institute for Supply Chain Research. I would like to thank you very much, Prof, for your time. And I'm going to take this opportunity to give it to Prof Ambe to conclude for our session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vinolia. Uh, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A special word of appreciation and thanks to uh, um, uh, guest of honor and a speaker, Professor Ashley Mtezo. I think um, you've done wonders and I think that all of us who are here uh, feel fulfilled and satisfied that it's a time well spent um, in this particular platform. Um, we do this every two weeks and we started it with a whole conceptualization on what ISCA can do for you in order to build your career. We further went in terms of clarifying and formulating and clarifying the research topic. Um, that was followed by how do you generate research ideas? And today we had a fantastic session um, with Prof. Ashley taking us through on how we start, you know, engaging in the literature review process. You would really agree with me that because I felt um, uh, overwhelmed. And uh, I particularly like the way Prof. Ashley responded to your questions. Um, she tried as much as possible to simplify it so that it can um, be understood by all. And on that note, I'm thanking you very, very much, Prof. And I also want to thank all of you here and just to remind you that uh, our next session will be on the 29th of April, which will be led by Professor um, Ravin Darena from the Northwest University Business School. He will be talking about how do we advance such strategies to find the right sources. The reason we are articulating this to you is that research by its nature, it is a systematic process. And therefore, we started at the inception on how you can start your research. And it is very, very important that as we are go, moving along with this journey, don't be left behind. Um, even if you know, it is very, very important because it becomes a refresher session that can be able to help you. Remember that you never know enough. And therefore, we encourage you to join us again on the 
29th of April. The next session after the 29th will be the 13th of May, which we're going to talk about organizing your literature and citing your resources. A lot of questions have been asked here about limited um, um, uh, resources on the studies and the various strategies have been provided by an esteemed professor. And you would also be able to learn how to cite the various sources of information that you've been able to, to collect. And thereafter, we're talking about understanding the research philosophies and approaches on the 27th of May, understanding qualitative research design on the 10th of June, understanding um, quantitative research design on the 24th of June. We'll talk about mixed research design on the 8th of July, negotiating access and research ethics on the 22nd July, getting started with your research sampling and selecting samples on the 5th of August, collecting and analyzing secondary research data, 19th of August, qualitative data uh, collection techniques, 2nd September. We'll talk about quantitative data collection techniques on the 16th of September. And on the 30th September, we're going to talk about qualitative data analysis and techniques and the quantitative data analysis and techniques on the 14th of October. And 28th October, we're going to talk about preparing and submitting your thesis and dissertation. And on the 4th of November, writing papers and articles from your thesis and dissertation. And we're going to end the session in the year on the 18th of November. How can you commercialize your research output? You know, the various applications that are available that you can be able to utilize. Um, colleagues, I'm not just saying this for the fun of it. I want you to see the systematic nature um, in which we've been able to organize the presentations so that you can be able to um, gain adequate knowledge and make meaningful contribution. In fact, we're going to like you to be able to come out with some research output by the end of the year, um, irrespective of the stage of your study in which you are. So on that note, um, Vinolia will be communicating with you all and also precious on the next event. And please, when that is out, please try and make sure that you um, register and attend. I take this opportunity also to let you know that we're going to be having on the 30th, uh, a key guest speaker from the industry um, who is an executive um, manager for the National Association of Automotive Manufacturers in South Africa. As you all know, the country relies on the, um, the private sector, especially the automotive industry to drive the transformation and economic imperative that we really need. Uh, many of the motor manufacturers in South Africa are now emerging into different African countries. And he will be speaking in a program which we have, we driven under the banner of the supply chain management game changer series to talk about the role of the um, South African automotive value chain to socioeconomic development in the continent. On that note, I want to thank you all and um, I appreciate the time and thanking our facilitator. I hand over to Vinolia. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Prof uh, Ambe. I believe that uh, we have reached um, we have reached uh, the conclusion to our meeting, and I would like I would like to thank everybody for availing themselves. And I believe that even on the way, next webinar, we are going to also avail ourselves like we did today. Um, have yourself a wonderful day, and um, thank you. Bye.